Hello, welcome to what's bubbling a Zim. I'm inventor Dan Zen, and in this bubbling, we're going to take a look on the Zim site, zimjs.com, at these gold bars down here. So they're new, and in the last bubbling, we took a look at some improvements to Zim Zap, and in this one, we're going to go into the tips. So in the tips, once again, we've got a gold bar up top to show you. We're in the gold bar section. And here are the tips, uh, namespace, chaining, loop, frame, distill, changes, missing, hit test, zog, and ask. Hmm. So each of those are represented in a little panel, and you can jump down to it, distill. And so this jumps you down to the distill section and go on back up to the top, etc. Or obviously you can just scroll on down wah, through the tips. Okay, I'll just go up to the top this way. Well, let's take a glance through what these tips are. I don't know if we'll have time to look into each one specifically. We'll see how it goes. The namespace. So as of a couple zims ago, we no longer need the zim namespace. Let's zoom in on that a little. So that's called the zim namespace right there, that word zim. And we used to have to say new zim circle, for instance, and that's no longer required. So we can say new circle. And this applies to the functions as well. We used to have to say zim.rand20. Well, now we can just say rand20. And that's pretty well everything. So um, stuff like frame, for instance, um, uh, we can just say a new frame. Some of the, the methods, uh, some of the methods that are placed on the display objects, things like drag and um, animate and move and pose and all those. We did not convert all of those methods. Those methods are also Zim functions, but we're hardly ever using them as Zim functions anymore. They're almost always used as methods these days. So we didn't bother converting those because there's some words in there that are pretty generic. Um, so uh, we didn't convert all of those, the, with the exception of a few that we actually can use as functions on occasion. Um, and so you'll have to look into that, like animate was one. And, uh, I can't remember. Uh, there were a few others as well. But in general, we no longer need to put zim dot in front. Now you're welcome to do that, and you're welcome to force that. Some people who are advanced coders go, oh, why? Why are you taking away namespaces? Um, you can uh, turn those namespaces so that you require them, and there's a bubbling on that. So you can go back and take a look at the bubbling. Or that was a news post here, so you might want to take a look at the news post. As we continue here, chaining. We've been chaining so much, and yet in both of these cases, both the, the namespace example here and the chaining, uh, many, many of the, you know, the Zim bits and the previous uh, tutorials and all the Zim captures and series and all that kind of stuff, they were using the Zim namespace and they weren't chaining. So um, these are things, that's why we introduced the tip section here, is just some changes to almost uh, the way we do things that uh, may be different than the past. What I think we'll do here at Zim is probably go through all of the Zim bits and update them to both the no namespace and the chaining because they're very popular. People are looking in at the bits and it, it, it's no longer really how we do our code. So it would be nice if we show the others how we've been building code here at Zim. We probably won't go into all of the capture videos. There's, you know, a hundred of them or something like that. <laughs> Redo those. We'll, we'll leave those. Um, and, and the tips, therefore, can help show um, some of these changes. So here's chaining. Once again, there's a bubbling video on chaining. So you're welcome to go in and see. Just in general, you put the object and then you chain onto the end of that with these dots, our methods. In the past, we would say var circle equals a new circle, semicolon and end that statement. And then we would say circle.center on stage, semicolon, circle.move, 100, semicolon, circle.drag, semicolon. And you can still do that, but that's just adding a bunch of extra um, identifiers there to the circle. Zim loop, we made that a little while ago, and now it's been a rare case where I go back to the for loop. Uh, Zim loop is just faster and easier. Even after years of coding, I would still have, I still on occasion make a mistake putting all of that stuff in into a loop. 
um, Zim loop, once again, we can loop a number of times and collect the index right there. And note the format is the same as, say, doing a um, uh, an event. Uh, you could say ball.onClick, comma, call that function. So you see how it's similar. There's our method. We have something in the beginning that might be an event, but in this case, it's a number. And then we call the function. That's also how we do uh, Zim timeout. It's how we do... Um, other things as well. So here, uh, Zim loop is really has power though when you're not just looping through a number. If you're looping through an array, so here's an array, and now we can put the array there. So we're saying loop through letters, and each time call this function, and then in the parameters you will get um, you will get the letter. So that becomes a the first time, b the next time, and we don't have to say uh, you know. Uh, var letter equals uh, um, letters at i anymore. And if you want, by the way, the next parameter in there is i, so that you can get the index still. It's easy to loop backwards. Oh, here's an example of looping backwards. You just throw a comma true on there, and that would loop through the letters backwards. So then you don't have to remember how to go, <laughs> oh, whatever. You don't have to adjust your your for loop here to go i minus minus and remember how does that go again all oh, by the count of the uh, whatever you know, etc swap these two things so it's just a simple parameter for reverse here we are looping through an object so here's an object with an age a job and a greeting and so we're looping through that object and each time we're given the property and the value so php's got something like that too um, and here it is in in zim and then here we are, uh, this is unique as far as I know to, to Zim, and that is here we are looping through elements of a container or objects in a container. So uh, we have a monsters container, we put a bunch of monsters in there. Now you might actually loop with the numbers to get those monsters in, but once they're in and say later on you want to do a hit test against all the monsters in a container, then you can just say loop through monsters and each time call a function, and you're given the monster, the container, like the element in the container, the object in the container. Now, if you're ever going to remove a child, so there we are saying monsters.removeChildMonster, or monster.removeFromMonsters, probably swap that around, um, you, would, you should loop backwards so that you don't mix up the count. And that's, that's regardless of whether you're using Zim loop, that would happen in a for loop as well. Anytime you remove something from an array or from a container in a loop, you want to loop backwards so you don't mess up the indexes. So remember, this is tips, and there you go, that's a tip. Here we have talking about, or here we're talking about Zim frame and um, reminding people that it's not just the fit, there's also a full window um, and uh, a bunch of other ones you can make them go into a tag as well so you can fit to an existing HTML tag then it acts like an image but an interactive image you can also have here's an example of multiple frames on the same page so it's not just one big uh, zip frame you can have multiple frames and there's even been people have put you know dozens of frames <laughs> don't know if I would recommend that but it's there. And uh, you can also use frame to load assets. So if you're familiar at all with CreateJS, I would recommend that you don't use, well, I mean, we're already using all of the CreateJS, preload.js, but just sort of simplify the procedure. So now it's just sort of two things. You load the assets and you can put as many as you want in an array. And you can go comma and say the folder those assets are in. But you load the assets. If you've only got one, you don't even need the array. You can just say pick.png. <coughs> And then you have an event when the frame is complete. <coughs> excuse me. When the frame is complete, call this function. And at that point, you ask for frame.asset, and then you use the same ID that you passed in here, or the same file name. Okay, and that simplifies it. That's now your bitmap. You could store that in a variable, or you can just directly center it on the stage, for instance. Uh, for the sound, uh, that's the, the sound, you can just play it. So I think you'll see that that saves you uh, probably twice as many lines as 
if you were using raw CreateJS, and it just conceptually a little bit easier. Hey, load the assets when they're complete. Here's your assets. Um, now, CreateJS has a, perhaps a little bit more flexibility, although we've been harnessing uh, all those things as well. You you can call a loaded event. You can call. Uh, you can save this as. In this case, we've got one frame.load assets, but if you're going to be loading multiple assets at different times, then probably just so you don't get confused with this complete event, you see if you load a second set of assets, it's still going to call this complete event uh, unless you clear this. So that's how I was doing it. I was saying, oh, on complete, and then you put comma null comma true there. That's the createJS on method. And that means that this complete event would only run once. And therefore your next load wouldn't run this complete event, that kind of thing. But there is a danger that the second load would actually load before the first and you cleared the wrong one or you know, <laughs> used the wrong one, that kind of thing. But uh, what you can do with Zim is just assign this to a variable. So you can say var load one equals this, and then you can say load one dot on complete. So you've got control, complete control over individual loading sets. So have a look at the docs for that. Frame also has a bunch of, uh, it's got a color property and a outer color property now. So that's new, the outer color property. No longer do you need to set, you know, your background HTML body uh, in, in CSS, which is what we were doing for a number of years. Um, you can just set the outer color property of frame and that will handle that for you. So that's kind of nice. Um, Frame's also got a bunch of colors that you're welcome to use, as well as shades, including frame.faint, which is handy. You can't click on something that's clear. Frame.clear is like RGBA 000040s, and that last zero or anything, and then that last zero being alpha. You can't click on something like that. It needs to have some sort of color. So frame.faint would be clickable, but it's as low as it can go, which is 0 0.01 in alpha or something like that. Frame.clear is, though, invisible. If you set um, a uh, expand, there's an expand method that you can use on anything. And you normally the expand method by default expands by 20 pixels, which means it's sort of a bigger hit area. That uses the CreateJS hit area. And um, uh, it can work with clear. So you can put in frame.clear for a color and then expand. And you can expand zero pixels and that would therefore be just the size of the hit. Or you can go to the, back to the create uh, commands with hit area. See you later! Bye, Ada! Uh, and then, sorry, French just leaving. Uh, what else? Oh yes, but just a reminder, as we go, here's a tip, as, as you go through any of the Zim examples, uh, whether that be the Zim bits or the, the video documentations, etc. I often am using frame.orange, frame.blue, and I always try and tell you, or this could be any color, any CSS color. It could be, quote, red, um, your hex number colors, uh, the short forms of those, or RGBAs, etc. So those are all available as colors as well. Distill, as we build things, it uh, people may sort of be leery and kind of say, oh man, there's just so much in Zim, this is getting bloated. And uh, there's always that danger, you know, many things become bloated throughout time and classic sort of Windows procedure. Um, but distill is here, and don't forget distill. It's quite easy to use. You put distill equals true at the very top of your code before you even call the frame. And then when you're done, when you think that everything's been loaded and you've, you've clicked on a bunch of stuff or whatever, you know, you've used all of the parts of your app, somewhere you need to call distill like this. So that might be on a click event of something. And you know, you just run everything and try everything out, make it move around and drag this here and drag that there. And then at some point, you know, you've got something where you're clicking. And if you call distill like this, what it does is it outputs to the console um, all of the number, well, numbers that represent all of the commands in Zim that you've been using, all of the functions, objects, that kind of stuff that you've been using. You then paste that into distill and it will give you minified code with only um, the code that you've been using. And, and that can be you know, 14K, it can be 27K, and it's no longer 230K you know, or whatever Zim's up to. 
Okay, do you get it? So um, don't forget about distill. And there's examples and docs on that. Changes. This is just uh, sort of saying, hey, we made certainly a lot of changes. And if you're still using old stuff or didn't know that stuff existed, that's, that's too bad. That's a missed opportunity. Um, we've tried to make it as easy as possible through things like the bubbling videos. We've got a new section, a blog, where every um, release uh, will be blogged. Not uh, every sort of mid-level release, what do we call it? Any new feature will be blogged, but not necessarily fixes or updates. Um, and as well, uh, video capture. Okay, so this is just looking through the last ones. We've added a transform tool. We're doing noise and generative art. We added accessibility, optional namespace. So some, even some of the tips then that we're listing here uh, have been um, described in the Zim bubbling sound waves, uh, talking about Code Zero, a philosophical look, the blobs and Bezier, stage shield, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that these things are fairly important, and that's only in the last couple of months. You know, that's since March, March, April, May, and it's four months, five months, or something like that. Now, I think we're slowing down. There has been some talk of sort of like, whoa, okay, whoa, we're we're stretching it, we're pretty well complete, my goodness, uh, pretty soon, any moment, we're going to be a full WYSIWYG editor, you know, we're going we're gonna to be Flash. We're already beyond Flash in a number of ways, um, just without the editor. Uh, so we'll probably slow down and concentrate more on getting people to use Zim and uh, the tools that can be used with Zim and, and less so on the actual uh, library increases. Uh, we've had you know, a half dozen requests over the last six months or so, and, and maybe even less, and each of those have been created. Um, but I think hopefully those are slowing down a bit. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. Noise and generative art being one, the transform tools being another, accessibility, um, animating to sound, uh, the um, particle emitters, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's sort of on the very leading edge of most libraries, those types of things. So I think we're kind of reaching a time where we won't be expanding quite as quickly. All right, so there's also the updates, which go into explicit detail about um, all of the changes. So they try and list every single change that went into each of these. And by the way, there, Zim has sort of a Zim, say, 6.3.2, has a major number. It has a feature number and a fixed number. So if we're just fixing things, we'll increase this end number. If we're adding a feature, like a method or a, or a new object or class or a control, we'll increase this one. If we change sort of the architecture, which we haven't totally, but we've, we've added things to it. We've added Zim Duo, the, the two ways to get parameters. Um, the Zim ZIC numbers, the ways that all parameters or many parameters can become a dynamic parameters. So these are sort of large changes. Accessibility was the latest one to move us into Zim 6 from Zim V. Um, et cetera, then that changes this, this first number. Okay. Now, in the updates, we specify what's an improvement and we specify what will break. And so uh, what break means is that if you take your existing code and move it, in, or, or sorry, you, I guess, use a new version of Zim on your existing code, there will be some, say, parameter orders that may have changed, for instance. So we adjusted recently the parallax parameters to be layers first, damp, auto, and stage. It used to be that the stage was required, and then partway through Zim's development, um, it was realized, well, we're adding stage to a lot of things. We don't, I don't really like doing that. So what we made was a thing called a default frame. And the default frame then has a stage. Default frame is the first frame made. And we kept track of that. So now any of the, the classes knows what a default frame is. And therefore, we don't really have to pass a stage in for a number of things. And that we went through changes, therefore, to the ticker, which used to require a stage, but now it doesn't. And we changed a bunch of things, but we didn't actually change at those at that time parallax. It had been the sort of the last holding out one. It was a module on its own that didn't really need frame. And therefore, we needed to specify the stage. It was very important. 
So now frame is just kind of taken over and, and everything that it's just so powerful now that it there'd be no point really in running parallax without frame really I, I don't think and and not only that um, uh, you've got distill anyway so we didn't have distill at the time and, and so forth so now rather than go a module approach it's more like a, a distill approach okay so there you go uh, and and hence we've decided that it's now time also not only that something unusual happened in that uh, and this would be in the updates as well, in that um, Chrome swapped the way that they handle scrolling. Uh, so, I, you know, I worked it before, and some last couple of Chromes, um, they've adjusted uh, how you can scroll. So that affected the scrolling parallax, which means really if you wanted any of your, even if you wanted your old parallax to work in new Chromes, uh, such as my my old parallax examples, weren't working in the current Chromes. I was like, holy cow, that never happened before, and it's very unusual, so I'm surprised it did. Um, and that's a good thing that is, you know, just once in a blue moon anyway. Uh, but in recent versions, 6.3.2, we'll now have that scrolling working properly. So at that time, we decided, hey, this would be good to swap the parameters since we're swapping anyway. And there we go. Okay, number seven. Um, if you are building, this is more of a building tip now, if you're building and something doesn't show up, it may be that there's nothing showing up. It may be that the thing that you thought should show up isn't showing up. Here's why. The internet could be down. Okay, so uh, maybe that's why nothing's showing up. You have an error, so check your console. That's F12. You'll have an error, and then that can make it so things don't show up. You forgot to add the object to the stage, so you can use add to, center, center reg. There's also add child, but that flips it. It's stage.addChild something, and we've gone to the chaining methods um, of add to, center, and center reg, and in a sense almost depreciated the CreateJS add child. Um, you may have forgotten to update the stage, so stage.update might be missing. And then there's the other one, you're seeing the stage.update and you're going, it's still not showing up. But that's because it may be in an event and events happen later. So if you click on something, you may have made a change, but you're not seeing the change. And yet you see a stage.update, but that stage.update could just be at the bottom of your code and happens when the, first, when the page first loads. You get it? And yet now you've clicked, and this is later. So you might need another stage.update in at the end of your event function for you to see a change. And then if you're adding a container, remember to add the container to the stage. You know, you're going, but I added it to the container. Well, maybe your container was not on the stage. And then finally, uh, you might be viewing the wrong file. So use Zog to detect this mistake. You know, make a Zog something and make sure that in the console you see that Zog. If you don't see the Zog, a nice simple Zog, you're probably working in the wrong file. And that certainly happens, especially if you're, uh, if you're a student out there and you're uh, putting files and you've got your teacher's version, you've got your version, you've got a backup version, you know, et cetera. Uh, some people have three of these hanging around. You know, maybe your tip is try and work on one file. But on occasion, yeah, you do want to have uh, two different versions, and that leads to the Zen five-minute rule, um, and that is uh, if you've been trying to fix something, anything, whether it's showing up in the stage or not, any bug for more than five minutes, confirm that you're viewing uh, the file that you're updating. So when you're editing a file, make sure that you're viewing the right file. Hit tests. A hit test almost never happens when the code first loads. Okay. And that's a common problem when you're first beginning your coding and you want to check to see if something's hitting something else. If you just do it right in your loading code, that happens right at the beginning, and that's probably not when you want the hit test. Okay, uh, You want the hit test either all the time, you know, checking all the time, and that would be in a ticker. You could want the hit test only when you're moving something. So if you pick something up and you're dragging it around and you want to see if what you're dragging is hitting anything, then you would put that in a press move event. So right in this function. If you want to only find out if you're hitting it when you mouse up, so when you drop it, that's in a press up event. So that would be like throwing something in the garbage. Okay, so there's some examples of a press up event. If you've got a couple objects, when you press up, 
you can say, hey, if the can is hitting the ball, hit test circle the ball, then remove the ball from the stage. Now, uh, here's a warning, and that is that if you've got a small thing and you drop it on a big thing, um, say a big rectangle, okay, so you have a small circle and you drop it on a big rectangle. If you say, if the ball dot hit test rect, you know, the big rectangle, that sounds right, doesn't it? You know, if the ball that you're dropping on a big rectangle is hitting the rectangle of that big rectangle, um, but that won't work, then, you know, then remove the ball. That won't necessarily work because you could have dropped the ball inside the rectangle. So what a hit test rect does, not a hit test circle, but a hit test rect, what that does is it checks points around the rectangle. It says, is the shape that you've said, so is the shape of the ball, that circle, is the shape of that ball hitting points around the rectangle of this can? And if your can is really big, and those points are around the side of it, well, then you can just drop the ball on the inside and it won't hit. There is also a check for right in the middle, but you may miss the middle. So the general rule is you always put the bigger object first. So you would say, is the big can, you put the can here, well, here's an example, is the big can hitting, and then whatever you've got left, the ball. The ball's a circle, so you would use a hit test circle on the ball. Okay, so now it's, is the big rectangle shape hitting points around the small circle? And that becomes points around the small circle, and you know that the, the big rectangle shape is not going to fit inside those points. Okay, there's different types of hit tests as well, and another tip here, hit test grid is great for when you've got a grid of something, and you want to find out if something's hitting, even the mouse, even, even the mouse. Like normally you would want to put mouse overs on all of the things in there. Uh, that's not the best way to do it. You, uh, that's even sl that's slower as well because it's comparing the point and and, uh, and a color underneath the point. So it has to do some image manipulation. And so say you're pixel drawing and wanting to you know draw a bunch of pixels by making the mouse roll over a grid. The fastest way is hit test grid. So look into that. Okay, and there's a capture on that. Zogging. Um, this is another sort of for newer coders as you're going. You want to zog, which is just short for console.log, and there's this console on the right hand side that you hit F12 and it shows up. If you're in Chrome and hit F12, you might have to find the console. But then after that, once you found the console, the next time you hit F12, it'll probably open up in the console. Okay. So um, in the console, you can log messages to the console that help you understand what your code is doing, what variables are, what the values are, uh, when things are running, or if things are running. And so zog is a short form for console.log. So console.log is JavaScript command, but that's a long thing to type. In other languages we have, we have things like echo and PHP and flash. We had, I can't even remember, trace was it? <laughs> trace, uh, other languages have print. Well, JavaScript's got console.log, and it's just like, oh my goodness. Now, in, in, in things like Atom, you can just start typing console and, and then find the, the tool tip there, the tip, and hit enter. But still, um, that's a really ridiculous way to log. If it were just log, that would be fine. So in Zim, we bound this to Zog. So Zog will do the same thing. It's just a short form. And the idea is, if you've got a function, we, we, have, we build functions in many ways or in many places. And if you've got a function, there's no point in writing a bunch of code in that function and then testing it, and then not knowing whether the code is broken or the function's not running. Okay, that, that happens quite often with uh, new coders is they'll build a little bit too much. They'll make a function, they'll put stuff in it, and then something won't work, and they keep on checking the stuff they put in the function and maybe can't find it, when in reality, the function's not even running, <laughs> okay? So the very first thing you want to do when you've got a function uh, is just put a zog in there, zog test. I often zog the function name. And then you, you'd catch, maybe you put like 10 different lines in there, right? And yet, if you don't run it, those 10 different lines are going to run. If you put a, a zog in there, you can see that it's not running. You look in the console and it's not there. You go, oh, my function's not running. Why is that? Oh, maybe I didn't call it. So you might have forgotten to actually call the function. And that's there. 
There's also various events, like when you click on something, you should zog that you've clicked. Don't even type anything else in there until you've zogged to make sure that your event function is working and that you know put it on the right thing or that you've spelled things right and so forth. Okay. Uh, here's callbacks. So callback functions in animate. When this animation is finished, we're going to call this function literal right here. We should zog to make sure that that function, when it's done, or sorry, that when the call, when the animate is done, that this function gets run. Same with tickers. That will that will zog all the time. It'll go, and and you go, okay, great. This is working. Look at it go. Wow, it's you know thousand tickings have gone by already. That kind of thing. And once you're done, you just comment that out or delete it. Intervals work the same way. Function or timeouts and loops. So these are, uh, that's a Zim interval, a Zim timeout, and a Zim loop. They're very similar to a JavaScript inter set interval and a JavaScript set timeout, but there are differences. First of all, they use request animation, right? Which means they don't necessarily run when your app isn't in view. And uh, there's other features as well. Not only that, but these two parameters are swapped. So in a set interval, the time goes at the end and the function goes at the beginning. Well, I was tired of having that, you know, that time on the end. I would always forget to put it there. It was like, you know, tucked away after this complex function in the middle. And so instead, we brought this into the same way that, um, for instance, a, an event works where you have the thing first and then the function. Okay, so here's the thing, and then the function, second. Same with timeout, and same with loop. See, so that's all kind of similar. And when you're looping, loop your eye. Make sure that you've got the right numbers. Oh, yeah, that's what I expected. Okay, that kind of thing. Finally, and this has been a long one, but I hope it's okay. I mean, if you didn't want to listen to the tips, you didn't have to, I suppose. Um, but um, there's been, you know, I tried to explain some extra things on the tips as well as you know what's actually there and that may help you especially if you're not necessarily somebody who learns by reading uh, learns by hearing something uh, here's my voice uh, this last one last tip ask it's okay to ask there's no question too small no question too big as it says there and here's an invite a hidden invite to the slack channel so that's the slack uh, the zim slack team and uh, as opposed to Slack channel, actually, I should maybe adjust that. That's a Slack team. And it has a bunch of channels like examples. So you can see examples. There's a general one where we can post anything that doesn't seem to fit in the other channels. News, we'll be posting news there. And you can post your news if you want. Questions, ask a question. And that's where, if you don't know, you're welcome to ask. And we love answering. And there's other people there who you know love Zim and will hopefully answer as well. And random is for chit chat that just kind of comes with Slack and requests. So if there's anything in Zim that you would like changed or added, etc., you could uh, put a request there. That's the easiest place for us to monitor that. There's also uh, issues that you can like. If you have issues, you can go to GitHub and uh, put issues there. But uh, sometimes we don't see that for a week or two. All right, there, my friends, is, well, we may as well hit the top this way, uh, Zim Tips. And I suppose that possibly could be something that could grow. Uh, we shall see. And it's what's bubbling. It's down here in the gold bar section of Zim. I'm Inventor Dan Zen. That's what's bubbling at Zim. Have a great day. Ciao.